All right, well, welcome everyone to the first lecture of our Reformation Then and Now lecture series. Uh, the Davenant Institute, which is sponsoring this event, uh, one, of our key, one of the key parts of our mission is to, to ask the question, what does it mean to be Protestant, and how should that inform the way we live as Christians today? I think very often we, we take our Protestant ident identity either for granted or, or else those who take it seriously often do so in this sort of very combative, confessionalist way uh, that, that, that clings to doctrinal formula without necessarily understanding uh, the spirit behind those doctrines. Why were those doctrines articulated? Why were they important? Why are they not just forms of words? Uh, so what we want to do at the Dabinet Institute is, is try to understand the principles that animated the reformers. Uh, not, not just what answers did they come up with, but why did they come up with those answers? What were the principles that they were working with? What were the concerns that drove the reforming work? And how can those principles continue to inspire our discipleship today as we seek fresh reformation in the church? So this lecture series, we're hoping to kind of look at both that historical and that contemporary uh, perspective and, 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 and dig into a bit of what the doctrines of the Reformation were and ask those questions of what that looks like today. So we have a, a, a great lineup of speakers over the next several months, and I'm uh, really grateful that Josh Malone is able to join us for the first one. Uh, Josh did his PhD at the University of Aberdeen at the same time that I was studying at the University of Edinburgh, and he's been working at Moody Bible Institute, Spokane, teaching uh, theology there since 2013, 2012? 2012, yeah. 2012 right. Uh, so uh, he's, uh, I, I teach philosophy up there. I'm grateful to Josh for getting me that gig a couple years ago. And um, so I'm glad to be able to return the favor in some small way by inviting him here to speak to you. So uh, his lecture will be about um, the, the way the doctrine of the Trinity cashes out in Reformation theology. And I think this will be of particular interest to many here for, because we've talked a lot in this community about the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, but in terms of linking that to the doctrines of the Reformation, how can we see Reformation theology as an unfolding of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, I think Josh's lecture is going to be really instructive on that. So uh, please join me in welcoming Josh Malone. Well, thanks for the kind uh, invitation to be here today. Uh, to my friends at the Davenant Institute and uh, those from Trinity Reformed Church, you need no reminders, right, that 2017 marks the 500th anniversary of Luther's 95 Thesis being nailed uh, or maybe glued to the Wittenberg door, um, at least uh, so the historians tell us. Uh, no doubt um, this group, though, um, looks back at the Reformation and what was accomplished there is a real triumph of the gospel. Whereas we know those in broader society, even those in other ecclesial traditions, often hear uh, and think of the Reformation and think of an entrance of all kinds of thorny problems, perhaps the founding of our modern moment, and perhaps even needlessly dividing the church. Um, against that perspective, I want to argue that the Reformation was a necessary course correction, uh, but the question is what kind of a correction um, that, that, that I want us to think about. And this lecture is the first, as, as Brad said, in the Davenant series, Reformation Then and Now. And the title of my lecture is The Spirit of Reformation Theology. And I wrote this uh, talk to crystallize some of my own thoughts on what I saw as some of the underlying theological instincts in the Reformation. And I was drawn to this line of reasoning, reading Rowan Williams, uh, Christoph Schwobel, and my uh, doctor father, the late John Webster, um, all, all folks reflecting dogmatically, theologically, on the Reformation. And what I'd like to suggest is that the Reformation was a recovery of something uh, even deeper. There was something underneath the soteriological clarity that they wanted to bring. It was fundamentally an attempt to say something about the doctrine of God in the history of fellowship with his creatures. And that message is still really good news um, and very relevant both then and, and now as the series has us reflect on. And this paper is an attempt then to reflect on that couple historically distant periods and connect that now. The 16th century Reformation, I'm gonna focus a bit on Luther and Calvin and some of the work they did. And then our own modern context in the 21st century uh, this paper is not, uh, just to tell you what I'm not going to attempt to do, it's not what the German theologians call dogma and Geschichte, which is uh, trying to tell comprehensively kind of what's going on with the Reformed dogma in any way. 
Um, nor am I attempting to try to tell the historical origins uh, of the five solas, but I will actually say something about them to try to explain them in light of God's Trinitarian action. Instead, the case that I'm going to try to make here is made by dogmatic description um, rather than by straight historical defense. So I'm going to try to just describe theologically what's going on. Um, chiefly, I'm trying to expose um, the reformers' basic insight into the divine and human action and recover its critical and constructive importance for today. Uh, this paper is about the opus Dei and the opus hominum, um, the work of God and the work of man um, in that order, um, and, and to try to emphasize what's going on in the Reformation to talk about that. My claim is that driving the Reformation was an underlying concern to reassert an account of the primacy of triune agency in the history of fellowship between God and his creatures, to talk about how God as the triune God works um, in history. That is, the Reformation was fundamentally a work of retrieval, both of this account of divine agency and uh, of the dogmatic vision of what that meant for the church um, to continue forward. And the aspect of retrieval that I'm focusing on is this particular account of how God is immediately working um, in, in triune agency and how that undergirds some of these later summaries of the Reformation that we'll look at in the five solas. Uh, one disclaimer here up front. Uh, as Brad actually gestured at the beginning, it's become really fashionable, not just here in Moscow, but in many places uh, in recent years, to link all theological discussion to a sort of idea of the Trinity. Um, I say idea, though, not necessarily the doctrine of the Trinity intentionally. Um, this modern idea, many times, that envisages uh, three distinct agents cooperating perhaps in a joint work. Um, Further, that approach often would maybe seek to see that sort of thing all over the place, traces of the Trinity uh, in analogs and in images and the created order. Um, so that's, that's not what I'm going to do here today. I just want to kind of gesture that up front. Um, instead, I'd like to focus on what I take to be uh, the pro-Nicene, following the, the Nicene pattern, uh, of emphasizing the indivisibility of the perfectly simple triune God. And then showing actually how you can see the indivisible, simple triune God working um, in triune ways. Now, I think that's going to become clearer as I go along. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about four things. First, I'm going to say a bit about Luther and where you can see some of this in Luther. And then about Calvin and where you can see some of this in Calvin. Uh, third, I'll talk about the five solas, uh, these Reformation summary principles that come up later in the tradition. And finally, I'll say a little bit about the continuing significance then of thinking about divine agency like this. So let me start at the beginning uh, with a story of a famous Augustinian monk, Mar Martin Luther. Luther was a, a monk with a huge anxiety complex, uh, as you would probably know. He had issues, um, as we probably say today. Um, if he were alive today, actually, I imagine, I imagine doctors would diagnose him with depression, um, probably right, actually, from some of the things he said. Um, Luther tried almost everything, he wrote about this, to shake his doubts. Um, in his struggles, he slept on hard floors, he went without food, he even tried to climb staircases in Rome on his hands and knees, nothing worked. He uh, couldn't assuage his guilt, even though his, his teachers in the Augustinian order told him he'd done enough, he should have peace in his soul, but he didn't. His sense of his own sin, he writes, was too strong. Luther had been studying uh, the Psalms, and he noticed how they spoke of the righteousness of God. Uh, but that phrase deeply concerned him. He understood it to mean God's punitive righteousness, wherein God punishes guilty sinners. And Luther knew he was a sinner. He was critically aware of this. And so when he read the word righteousness in Scripture, all he saw was God's wrath. And as he was struggling under this weight, he continued to study the Scriptures. And he recounts the book of Romans uh, that he was reading one day. This is his famous tower experience. And in Romans 1, 16, he read the gospel of Christ is the power of God for salvation, and he thought, this is good news. But then in verse 17, he went on and read, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. And there it was again for Luther, this problematic word, and he began to doubt again and wondered how, how again Paul could have written uh, these harsh, dark words. But he realized in this, as he writes about this moment, maybe he had misunderstood them. And he studied a bit more, and suddenly 
He says his darkness was turned into light. And here's what he wrote. Just now I'll quote Luther. Quote, he says, I hated that word, the righteousness of God, which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I had been taught to understand philosophically, according to the form or active righteousness, as they called it, in which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. At last, though, Luther writes, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of those words. Namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. And Luther goes on, there I began to understand that right, the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live as a gift from God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness, which merciful God justifies us by faith, as it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt I was altogether born again and had entered paradise through the open gates. There, a totally and other side of the face of scripture showed itself to me. Now, I want us to think a bit about that quote, about what Luther says he's discovered here. Because it's very common today, um, particularly by some um, Roman apologists, to say that Luther's reading of scripture was primarily a bid for individual freedom or, or autonomy, a choice of the self over uh, external authority in the church. However, notice what Luther is doing um, and even what he says. It's a protest against the belief that even his own fear and anxiety can be solved by an immediate appeal to any human authority, churchly, or his own. Neither his own effort, right, nor indulgence, nor any other form of creaturely absolution would do. Now, Rowan Williams uh, writes on this, and he's insightful, I think, here for us. Here's what he writes, quote, Luther himself, describing the evolution of his theology, identifies his major breakthrough with a moment of new understanding concerning the Bible's language about God's justice. He previously had thought of that as a virtue by which God has the right to condemn sinners. And he accordingly feared and hated this language. But he suddenly came to see that it should be read, ex be read expressing what God does for us, end quote. Now that's quite important here. Why? Well, because for Luther, it places us at the center of the divine action of God's gratuity, almost arbitrarily so, actually, when he writes about this. Um, the move he's making, though, is to front the primacy of God's action, of divine action, prior to and guiding all human actions. And that reordering for Luther, it goes all the way down. If, for Luther, we are to think about God's justice, we ought first to think of God's action to declare us just. And God's justice, he says, is, is not a reaction to our own behavior, nor simply a standard by which he judged us, right? But instead, it's, it's an initiative quite irrespective of our behavior, where God is free to do what he wills, and his freedom takes the form of acting so as to change us. Only from that divine work are we called just. So therefore, again, William says, it would be, quote, a mistake to think Luther or any classical Protestant believed that justification meant only a change in God's attitude without an effect upon us. On the contrary, what changes is that we become the locus of God's free activity, unprovoked, unconditioned, and unconstrained by any other agent. God steps into the void and chaos of created existence and establishes himself there as God, end quote. Again, we need to linger a bit on that central theological insight of the Reformation that seems to ignite so much. To do so, we need to make a bit of a distinction, and I want to distinguish uh, what I will rather idiosyncratically call the formal and the material principle of the Reformation. I'm modifying a bit uh, something Kevin Van Hooser says in his book, Biblical Authority After Babel. You're likely familiar with people talking about the formal principle of the Reformation as sola scriptura. Like we'll talk about sola scriptura later. But here, I'm actually going to name the formal principle as uh, what Luther is seeing here about justification, justification by faith alone. 
is what I'll call uh, the kind of form of what Luther is saying first here, justification by faith alone. And that phrase almost directly cites scripture, doesn't it? Um, we've been justified by faith, Romans 5.1, and Christ comes that we might be justified by faith, Galatians 3.24. Um, this formal principle of the Reformation, as I'll call it, becomes an abiding pastoral comfort to Luther for his existential and spiritual angst and to our own as well. Yet the claim, right, of the Reformers is that justification is by faith alone. And, and the term or word alone doesn't come from those texts I just cited. Although certainly we could find that concept, couldn't we, other places. Saving faith is often contrasted with works, like in Romans 4 or with works of the law, like in Galatians 3, indicating it stands apart from those efforts, and by implication, it's in that sense alone. But what does the added word alone, again, that starts to get used out of the Reformation here, signal? It brings us to what I would call the material principle of the Reformation, and I'll name this by saying, the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action. Um, this material principle that the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action. The gracious action that God the Father is doing in Christ by the Spirit is seen to be absolutely primary. And that material principle is, is the inner substance, as I'm envisioning this, uh, of the formal principle by which God declares sinners righteous by faith. Luther himself seems to recognize this, um, at least as early as 1520, when he claims that the Trinity is, quote, the highest article of faith, the article on which all others hang. Now that, that sounds rather different, perhaps, than the Luther-esque quote we're used to hearing, right? Justification by faith is the article by which the church stands or falls. Um, however, for Luther, the centrality of that formal principle, justification by faith, seems to first be grounded in this material principle that the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action. And the formal principle, again, as I'm calling it, of justification by faith is central precisely because it accurately depicts the interrelation between divine and human action. Now that isn't isolated in Luther. Eight years later, when he writes his larger catechism, he explains it this way, quote, the Apostles' Creed was once divided into 12 articles. We shall summarize the entire Christian faith in three chief articles, according to the three persons of the Godhead, on whom everything we believe is focused. The Creed might be summarized very briefly in these few words. I believe in God the Father who created me. I believe in God the Son who redeemed me. And I believe in God the Holy Spirit who sanctifies me. This is in his introduction um, to his larger catechism. And what you see there is for Luther, the source of gratuity and, and the comfort of the gospel he battled for in the Reformation would find its ground in the life and action of the triune God. So, again, in the same document, Luther sums it up this way, quote, in these three articles, God himself has revealed and disclosed with deepest profundity of his fatherly heart, his sheer inexpressible love. He created us for the very purpose that he might redeem us and make us holy. And besides giving and entrusting to us everything in heaven and on earth, he has given to us his son and his Holy Spirit in order to bring us to himself through them. Again, note what Luther does here. He focuses on the directness of the triune agency of God, working um, as the tradition has talked about, by his own two hands, by the Son and the Spirit, to bring us to the Father so we can experience, as Luther puts it, his fatherly love. And I'd, I'd submit that for Luther, he's being fairly clear here that many of the flashpoints of the Reformation that were debated, revelation and its standing, justification, faith, these formal principles, as I've called them, uh, they all find their proper context and shape within Trinitarian theology. And that's being said with some regularity, it seems, since the beginning of the Reformation. So that's first, just a bit about Luther. Next, let me look a bit with Calvin and show you how some of the same material principle being expressed by Luther can also be seen in John Calvin. Calvin, as you know, uh, will be a second generation Protestant reformer. 
That is, Calvin came in the wake of Luther and Zwingli, and uh, tried, and in many ways succeeded, uh, to synthesize some key aspects of Reformation thought, Protestant teaching. Uh, I want to try to focus similarly on how Calvin, again, takes up what I've called this material principle of the Reformation, that the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action. And specifically in what Calvin says about the church, I think this is very telling on this. Calvin's mature theology, uh, looking at like the 1559 edition of the Institutes, is a helpful place to look. The meaning and structure of how he organized that edition is a point of scholarly debate. Um, I'm inclined to think the ordering perhaps follows the Apostles' Creed, um, but people debate this uh, many times. Book one, knowledge of God the Creator, that is, of God the Father. Book two, knowledge of God the Redeemer in Christ, that is, God the Son. Book three, the way we receive the grace of Christ, that is by the Spirit, uh, which he says many times specifically there. And uh, fourth, the fourth book, Means of Grace, that is the Holy Catholic Church, as he spells out the life of the church. Um, no doubt more specialized scholars than I will continue to debate that. Um, I would only say the structure could be seen um, to follow that pattern. There are other things it seems also going on in it. In terms of the, the content of what Calvin teaches, scholars of both Calvin and Luther have used the phrase that the church is a creature of the divine word to summarize the emphasis that's going on there on divine agency forming the church, um, that the church is a creature of the divine word. So far as I can discern, um, neither of these figures use that phrase in that way explicitly, but it certainly seems to describe some central aspects of their ecclesial thinking, namely that the church itself is called into existence and constituted by the divine word, that is by God's triune agency. And as such, the church has no standing apart from God's originating word and his sustaining power. Um, Christoph Schwebel summarizes this in his essay, The Creature of the Word, and he says, quote, as the creature of the divine word, uh, the church is constituted by divine action, and the way in which the church is constituted by divine action determines the character and the scope of human action in the church. Note, notice again the way that's being summarized, a similar impulse here. The church itself is understood to be distinct from the divine word that forms and upholds it. And that distinction is drawn to warn off any potential error of collapsing the church and the divine word together, denying then, in the Reformation, the infallibility of the church or its office, and simultaneously trying to name an asymmetry between word and church. The divine word calls the church into existence and maintains the church, but not vice versa. Now, Calvin draws on this distinction. Let me show you how he draws on this idea and why that does seem to be a helpful summary. In his polemic against Rome, when he denies that the church is rightly called the mother of Scripture. So this is an image that's being used at the time that the church is the mother of Scripture. And Calvin says, uh, quite straightforwardly here, quote, The church is not the mother of Scripture. She is built on the apostles and prophets. And he cites Ephesians 2.20 here. If the church, uh, teaching of the prophets and apostles is the foundation, they must have had authority before the church began to exist. And he reasons then through that text, um, using the Paulian image of the church as a Trinitarian building project, if I can call it this, in Ephesians 2. Because there Paul pictures the church as this great architectural work. Built on the solid foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself as the cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. And then the building itself, the whole structure, is made up of ladder stones growing into a, a holy temple of the Lord, in uh, verse 21 of, of Ephesians 2. And as the communion of the saints are being dwelt, built into a dwelling place there for God, which I take that to be a reference to the Father, by the power of the Spirit, in verse 22. Um, Cal Calvin walks through this text to show what the church is. And he takes that picture to be dogmatically, or theologically that is, central to a description of the relationship between scripture itself and the church. How so? Well, apostles and prophets grounded in Christ himself symbolize holy scripture, which is foundational. And the building symbolizes the church. And since the foundational moment, Right, is the divine word coming through the emissary of the prophets and apostles, 
The building itself is necessarily subsequent to and reliant upon the foundational work of God through Christ and his divinely inspired spokespersons. The church can't be mother, right, Calvin says then, because she's a creature um, in this image of the divine word given through the prophets and apostles, and that founds this church, this ecclesial community. A little bit later in the Institutes, again, he's, he's working on this point. Um, and he says it's improper actually to invoke Augustine on this point to try to prove that the church is somehow prior to Scripture. Instead, Calvin says to say with Augustine, that's a quote from Augustine here now he cites, quote, I would not have believed Scripture was God's word unless I had been taught this by the church, end quote. He says Augustine is only relating his own experience. He says nothing of the actual source of authority, which comes from Scripture first. And Calvin indicates that all Augustine really could do here is actually indicate his own experience of conversion, but he could actually never, through that experience, give a definitive account of the origin of divine authority. He could just talk about where he, where he ran into that, if you will, occasionally, but he couldn't actually give a definitive account of that. Again, by insisting on that kind of a distinction, the priority between word and church, church being a creature of the divine word, Calvin is asserting the Reformation's material principle that the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action. One of the more famous moves I, I imagine you're familiar with that Calvin makes in working out this material principle is describing the difference between the invisible and visible distinction in the church. And Calvin sees that distinction is rooted in exegesis. Again, I'll just read a, a bit of the quote from him here. He says, for we see that Holy Scripture speaks to the church in two ways. Sometimes by the term church, it means that which is actually in God's presence, into which no person is received except those which are children of God by the grace of adoption, true members of Christ by sanctification and the Holy Spirit. Again, notice the Trinitarian pattern there. By God, in Christ, by the Spirit. Um, this is how he'll consistently name this. Um, often, though, the, the name church, he goes on to say, designates a whole multitude of men, right, spread all over the earth who profess to worship one God in Christ. And they are by one baptism initiated to faith in him, partaking in the supper and attesting their unity to true doctrine. And the word of the Lord, they have agreement. And the preaching of the word ministered um, under Christ is, is uh, preserved there. That church, Calvin says, right, is min mingled with many hypocrites who have nothing to do with Christ but name and outward appearance. And there are very many ambitious, greedy, envious persons, Calvin says, evil speakers, some with quite unclean clean lives. Such are tolerated for a time, either because they cannot be convicted by a competent tribunal or because vigorous discipline does not always nourish as it ought. A nice Calvinian statement there at the end. Um, that invisible, visible distinction uh, is central, though, isn't it, to Calvin's account of the church. The primacy of divine agency unseen in the invisible church, marked by election, known by God alone, is the object of present faith and our future hope, according to Calvin. And God, as he works in the world, his work is seen together, isn't it, with creaturely work, thus the visible church, which is marked by those gathered together in worship, partaking sacrament, and standing under gospel preaching, observable in our present experience. And that's always a mixed company, Calvin says, right? Of evil and good, elect and reprobate. Now, whether one agrees uh, and thinks Calvin's doctrine of election itself is defensible in that way, it does serve for Calvin to exegetically distinguish between the church that originates from divine action and human congregations that bear that reality in part, yet are not identical with in that primary divine action of God. So, again, here with Christoph Schwubel, similarly to his soteriology, it is the function of Calvin's doctrine of election in his ecclesiology that safeguards the sole agency of God in redemption and in the gathering together of the church. By interpreting the fact of salvation and the existence of the church as grounded in God's election, believers are given confidence that the foundation of their faith is there. So properly understood, just to summarize that, uh, this insistence on the invisibility of the church is a standing denial of any easy identification between the divine and human work. It secures the point 
that the triune God's action is primary in his gracious work. It names it, has a very particular way to name it and to conceptualize it and then to see it um, and to experience it. Um, again, that's just a brief summary. We could say more, uh, but we won't. Just to say, Luther and Calvin are going to be consistently using some of this language that seems to have a Trinitarian seedbed, um, if I can put it this way, or the agency of the triune God is grounding the, the claims they're making doctrinally in this kind of a way. In light of that very brief sketch of some of what drives uh, more of the tectonic moves of the Reformation, namely that the action, again, of the triune God is absolutely primary and it's immediately experienced by the church. We'll focus on both these things. Um, let me say a little bit about the five solas. The five solas, um, as, as we've often referred to them now, are not offered as a systematic summary of the Reformation by any of the magisterial reformers, not by Luther, Zwingli, or Calvin, nor their immediate heirs. Later 20th century historians of doctrine have expressed them as a synthesis of reform teaching. That's where these come from. Now that said, the solas do actually seem to neatly summarize some primary doctrinal themes expressed in early reformed thought. Um, what's more, certain concepts expressed there, like sola gratia, grace alone, or sola fide, uh, faith alone, were used by the early reformers themselves. We can actually see some of these things. I would actually suggest the primacy of those two things, of uh, grace and faith in God's saving work, in particular seem to appear in the early reformers because they can be rather straightforwardly glossed from scripture. And, and they quickly become part of the Protestant vocabulary as they follow this exegetical pattern of reasoning. Now, but beyond just their basic exegetical restatement, I'd actually suggest that this term alone that's often used now is a linguistic signal to mark the utter primacy of the divine agency that the reformers were insisting upon, that that word is actually working together to make that claim. Just like I've done with Luther and Calvin, I won't attempt a nuanced historical reading of the five solas. Um, it would be odd to do that because, again, they aren't exactly formulated that way early in history. Instead, I'll give a brief dogmatic description of each. That is, I'll suggest how they're each grounded in the Reformation's material principle that the triune God is absolutely primary in his gracious action as they elucidate formal principles like justification by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. So let me start there. Um, I'll start with scripture itself, uh, with sola scriptura. And uh, John Webster here, I think, helps orient us well. He says the triune God has ordered created reality as the domain of his saving presence in speech. Sola scriptura, as I'd like to talk about it, speaks of the decisive way in which the word of God, given through the prophets and apostles in Holy Scripture, is the triune God's communicative presence to his people in this economy of grace. That claim is actually meant, again, to, to forefront the primacy of God's communicative action or agency, and it's actually underwritten by a particular account or ontology of Scripture. Um, let me sketch the particular ontology of Scripture I have in mind that roots the divine activity that way. And here, I'm trying to take a cue from Bob Inc.'s doctrine of Scripture um, about the continuing presence of God through the inscripturated word, a bit more so than Barth's approach to putting the doctrine of the Trinity in the doctrine of Revelation. I'm trying to do something more like what Bob Inc. does here. Um, you can tell me if I succeeded. Um, Sola Scriptura, in this manner, is highlighting the primacy of divine agency in the word of God in the world. And that agency can be seen, um, again, to take a page from how Bobby does some of this, um, from the founding act of God in the world. God said, spoke, let there be light. And the Father here is initiating creation by his speech. What's more, um, as the history of divine um, fellowship continues, what issued forth at creation, that self-communicative father continues to speak words of truth and of life to his creatures. First in the garden with commands and promises, and then in post-lapsarian history through the divinely inspired spokespersons, prophets, and apostles. And the scriptural witness to God's speech is often summarized by the repetition in the Old Testament 
of the prophetic pronouncement, thus saith the Lord. Um, Exodus 4, 22, 5, 1. It's, it's a consistent fr uh, frame we'll see in the Old Testament. Or the Lord said unto, Exodus 9, 1, or Leviticus 21, 1, and so forth. Likewise, the New Testament, uh, in particular the Gospel of John, provocatively highlights the witness of the living word of God there identified as the eternal son who assumes flesh, the divine word. The word of God who was in the beginning with God the Father, John 1, 1 and 2, and who was God by nature, John 1, 3, he is the very word who became flesh and dwelt among us, the only begotten son from the Father, John 1, 14. What's more, the scriptures maintain that the way in which the word spoken from the Father works is inseparably with the power of the Spirit. Again, you can go back to the Old Testament, right, and see this born witness to. Um, in creation, the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the waters, and God says. Or uh, the same Spirit can be seen anointing the prophets in the Old Testament. The Spirit of the Lord came upon 1 Samuel 1, 19, 2 Chronicles 15, 1. So also, in the New Testament, we read, again, a similar witness to this. No prophet ever spoke from his own initiative, but by the Spirit, in 2 Peter 1, 21. Dogmatically, you might sketch that all like this. Here's the summary bit. Scripture is the Father's speech in the Son, perfected by the Spirit. Um, we're hearing the triune God as we read Scripture. We hear the Father's voice in the Son, perfected by the Spirit. It would at least be one way to try to make this claim. And identifying that triune agency, the work of God, as the ontological ground of Holy Scripture is not primarily a philosophical claim about communication theory. That, that's not what I'm saying. Instead, it's actually a theological claim about the Trinitarian action that grounds Holy Scripture. Now, it's that character of the absolute primacy of the divine word given through prophets and apostles recorded in Holy Scripture that drives the Reformed belief in the uniqueness of Scripture, Sola Scriptura. To emphasize this primary uniqueness, the term sola, again, I'm suggesting, is, is getting appended here to the term scriptura. And for the Reformed, this becomes and uh, draws a very clear contrast and a counterpoint in their understanding of God's agency or his presence uh, with that of the Roman church. And it, that helpful counterpoint can be seen if you look at what Trent responds to here when the, when the Protestants are saying these things. So Council of Trent on Scripture 1546 pronounces this, quote, The purity of the gospel may be preserved in the church after the errors have been removed. It also clearly perceives that these truths and rules are contained in written books and in unwritten traditions. And they go on then to list the Old Testament books, apocryphal books, and the New Testament books. If anyone does not accept as sacred, Trent says, and canonical the aforesaid books in their entirety, and with all their parts, as they have been accustomed to be read in the Catholic Church, and as they are contained in the Old Latin Vulgate, and knowingly and deliberately rejects the aforesaid traditions, let him be anathema. Now Trent here is, is straightly, uh, straightforward here, uh, denying the Protestant teaching, I think, about the shape of divine agency via sola scriptura. N note well, though, Trent is not denying the doctrine of the Trinity. It's not what they're doing. They're not even denying that God's agency is, is primary. They're also not denying that. Yet, interestingly, um, if you read through all the doc documents of Trent, they never actually treat the doctrine of God. Um, and, and I got that's curious. It, it, one reason, I believe, perhaps, is the Reformation's critiques about how God's agency works don't seem to be what they're responding to. They seem to res respond in other ways to what they've said. Um, and I wonder, did they actually grasp? that that's actually what was being asserted by the Protestants. Um, I'm not sure. However, you can see in that quote again I just read, Trent does intend to deny that Scripture itself could act as God's free word, such that by it, God himself might directly guide and reign over his church. And I take that to be the proper sense of alone, um, that the Protestants want to say God's word is free, he acts through it, and it can actually directly guide his church in that sort of way. Agency, God's word can be that direct and from the triune God. 
Countering that, Trent asserts in that quote I just read that the church is the domain where divine agency is wit not simply witnessed, sorry, not simply ministered, but actually infused and imparted because the church is able to magisterially rule, as they worded it, over written books, scripture, and over unwritten tradition. Um, it's a very different account of agency then that, that they've offered um, in, that, in that construction of scripture. And the reformed protest to this is that the Roman church has collapsed the triune God's absolute and primary agency into the structure and life of the church in such a way that God's word is no longer free, but instead subject to created institutions and traditions. And the Reformation asserts that by doing so, Rome is actually denied that the church remains a creature of the word. That's why they want to use different language to describe that relationship, mother rather than creature. Instead, again, they reverse the formula, believing the church to be mother of the word. So again, to summarize this, the Reformation phrase uh, that explains sola scriptura, they, they seem to point this same way when they say scripture is the norm of norms, which itself cannot be normed, right? They, they seem to want to assert something like God's agency is directly exercised through the scripture, and there's no higher agency to regulate that. And that's not, again, a denial for the Protestants of other resources for the church. The reformers readily and consistently admit to other external guides like creeds and confessions and other forms of ecclesial teaching. Yet they insist those must be seen as normed norms, relative rather than absolute guides. And scripture, therefore, is to be confessed in later confessions as the rule of faith and life. The reason... Scripture stands uniquely, i.e. alone, in the economy of divine grace is because God's abiding communicative presence can never be domesticated or collapsed into any created reality. Even the sanctified reality that the church is, um, the Protestants are insisting this. So again, it's, it's particular account of divine agency, it seems to me, that they're wanting to capture, even when they talk about scripture itself. That's what makes sense of this solo. Second, and more briefly with that first sola established, um, sola, solus Christus. Now, solus Christus speaks of the way in which the word of God incarnate in Jesus Christ is the one mediator of God's triune saving mission, 1 Timothy 2.5. Just like with scripture, the centrality of Christ in the saving mission of God was not up for debate. And instead, Protestant retrieval here, it seems to me, focused on how Christ's work is mediated and received. Again, John Webster, I think, helpfully summarizes a Protestant account here of the directness and non-transferability of Christ's agency in his essay on ecclesial, uh, evangelical ecclesiology. Here's a quote from him. Quote, first, the ministerial acts of Jesus Christ and the Spirit by which he gathers and protects and preserves the church are, properly speaking, incommunicable and non-representable. That is to say, if by communication or representation, we mean the assumption of Christ's proper work by agents other than himself, we may, may not make use of such concept, concepts in a Christologically and pneumatologically structured theology of ministry. He goes on here, just to explain this, the dogmatic premise of an evangelical ecclesiology is this, that as risen and ascended Lord, Jesus Christ is present and active, and it does not permit any transference of his agency. Christ distributes his own benefits through his spirit, that is, by his own hand. They are not to be thought of as some treasures turned over to the church for it to dispense. Again, Webster, I think there, helpfully draws a number of aspects of Christ's reign in the church. First, Christ's work, his proper work, as he calls it, to gather, to protect, and to preserve the church is his. Creaturely participation in witness, in proclamation, in pastoral care, and oversight do not displace Christ's primary action. Instead, we work from God in those actions. And as we work from God, Christ does not communicate his work to us 
so as to infuse or impart what is properly his. That cannot happen, as Webster claims, because Christ never stops working. There's no lapse um, for us to step into. Thus, Christ, as the one mediator, distributes his own benefits through his spirit. Thus, the sanctifying and saving work of Christ, perfected in this by the spirit, are never transferred to the church as a possession for it to dispense. Instead, Christ is ubiquitously, always, ever, present to his people, even till the end of the age, as he promises in Matthew 28. The perfect mediation of Christ, as, as Calvin so loves to focus on, uh, through his entire earthly work and continued reign, stands complete and present for the church. Um, and, and solus Christus, again, one way to think about what's going on there, again, is that triune agency that actually we're experiencing from the Father through Christ and the Spirit. That brings us to sola fide. Again, I'll be progressively shorter here. Faith alone speaks of the way in which Christ's work of salvation, actively achieved, is passively received by human creatures. The triumph of divine agency over creaturely self-assertion, at least biblically, I would want to say. Whereas some latter Protestants have taken the biblical call to faith as, as a sort of watchword sometimes for a fuzzy, non-works implicated response that's somehow initiated by the creature, Faith, I would suggest, according to the Reformation, is better understood almost as a negative concept sometimes that opens up space to speak about something else. It seems to function sometimes this way. That something else focuses us away from the creature and back toward God as sinful humans astonishingly confess salvation is from the Lord. And that confession always implicates the triune God as the primary actor. And as humans in a state of humble receptivity. And, and we allied the reformed instinct here if we first consider our confession as something we muster up ourselves. Lutheran theologian, again, uh, Schwobel, um, explains this element in Luther's own description of the faith. Quote, the human act of faith is made possible by God's agency as the agency of Father, Son, and Spirit. God creates the world ex nihilo, that is out of nothing, and establishes a relationship with human creatures in which they can act in accordance with or in contradiction to God's creative will. In Christ, God discloses the truth about his relationship to his human creatures against the contradiction of sin in his faithfulness and his justifying grace. And by the Spirit, God authenticates this uh, revelation as the truth about the relationship to humanity and the world, thereby creating the certainty which faith makes possible. Um, it's a lovely little summary, actually, of what Luther does there by Schwobel. That triune agency, again, makes the church itself a possibility, acknowledged by the human act of faith away from the self and toward God. Um, get another quote from Schwobel here. Just as sin is basic orientation, or better, disorientation, the activity of sinful humanity, faith itself is basic orientation for all actions of redeemed humanity. Luther's emphasis on faith as, as shorthand for faith in the promises of God fulfilled in Christ, or simply faith in the word of God sometimes, points directly this way too. Calvin, too, on this, uh, points in a very similar emphasis discussing faith. In contrast to medieval Rome, uh, who seemed to focus on faith chiefly as assent to a truth through creaturely cooperation, and faith's content chiefly being an uninformed, implicit trust in the church, Calvin against this asserts this famous quote on faith. Quote, faith is a firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, founded upon the truth of the freely given promise in Christ, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Again, those elements uh, of faith there for Calvin should be noted, chiefly that, that faith is grounded in God's triune agency. God the Father's benevolence, given to us through Christ the Son, who is reconciling us, and this is revealed and sealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Faith happens, for Calvin, in this economy, of this working of God's grace, his triune working. Again, the comparison with, with Trent on justification here is really helpful just to notice the difference on what they say about faith under the, the uh, Council of Trent on Justification. 
quote, if anyone says that a sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary to be prepared and disposed by action of his own will, let him be anathema. Again, no notice how they've articulated the cooperation of divine and human agency here to obtain justification that's being asserted by Trent. It, it's the distinction, again, that this understanding of what the reformers are offering about the primacy of divine agency and action, and on that basis, sola fide, um, faith alone, is being confessed. Even more briefly now, sola gratia, which speaks in the way in which salvation is sheer gift, grounded in the absolute primary work of God. Because the human creature does nothing to merit or anything to, to merit divine deliverance, it's by grace alone. And as we've seen, the gift character of God's reconciling work begins at the behest of the Father, is accomplished in the work of the incarnate Son, and is brought to bear on the believer by the perfecting work of the Spirit. So sola gratia functions as a way to highlight that absolute gratuity of salvation from God. Um, again, let me just cite a bit from Ephesians 1 here, which I think is a nice summary of this. God the Father choosing us in Christ before the creation of the world, Ephesians 1.4, to the praise and glory of his grace, Ephesians 1.6. Through the redemption of Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us, Ephesians 1.7, culminating in, quote, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Notice that Trinitarian pattern again, the Father's choosing the redeeming in the Son's blood given to us in the promised spirit, and that work is identified as the praise that we offer him uh, because of this work as his grace. Because it's a sheer gift accomplished solely through the preeminent activity of the triune God. And the Reformers are picking up on, on this kind of pattern in language and as they're, as they're expressing these, these, um, these solas that we now later try to summarize. Finally, again, uh, very briefly, as a result of this marvelous work, the church responds. Um, in astonishing um, praise, soli de gloria. God's grace um, alone is due all glory because salvation is won solely through God's agency. And this sola almost seems to me to function as a sort of coda, summarizing what the other so solas have established about divine agency and then repeats it back to God. In the church's confession of soli de gloria, we echo back in wonder, in love, and in fear the acknowledgement that the gospel is the grace of God by which we've been saved and in which we now live. And in speaking this back to God, we confess the truth of the gospel and we call upon the gospel's God. This act of praise is continual, and it's what characterizes the life right, of the church. As I think Paul wonderfully summarizes here, for from him, through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That's Romans 11, 36. Now, I could stop there, and it would be actually liturgically probably appropriate for me to stop there. Um, <laughs> but this is a paper, an academic paper, and it's a Reformation then and now. I, I want to say a little bit more about the now um, and finish on that. Um, maybe just suggest two things uh, that, that I noticed today when people pick up Reformation language, and particularly some of the solas. Um, some ways that it, you can see from the reformers there's this delicate balance, almost this art, it seems to me, of distinguishing and relating the triune divine agency or activity and subsequent human agency or activity and how easily that can be disordered. Um, you, you see that in, in a lot of the work, some of which you just mentioned. And so let me mention two things. One way I think that can go very badly today, it works out badly, and one way I think we can follow that fruitfully today. Um, so sort of a pathology that we can maybe correct and a, a really good exhortation. First, it's very easy, I noticed today, um, and has been, it seems, since the dawn of the Reformation and before, presumably, to take grace alone, this idea, and, and to run with it to what I might call hyper-grace. Um, if salvation is solely grounded, perhaps we'd reason, in the work of God and solely received by faith, it must mean that all I bring to God is my sin, but his grace is always bigger than that, right? 
in, in the wake of the Reformation, people have picked up this kind of line of reasoning. Um, sometimes it's been used to set up, I think, large-scale scriptural dichotomies, sort of ways to read scripture, reading any command in scripture as law and distinguishing that from the promises and saving work of God as gospel. Um, sometimes that becomes a giant hermeneutical principle. Um, now, I want to say, actually, no doubt, such an analysis can give some insight into scripture, um, some insight. Um, chiefly, it can actually help you think about distinguishing and relating divine agency and human agency. That's one, one thing it could actually do. You can start thinking about, I think, with that kind of distinction. But for many, I'll suggest that kind of language becomes an overarching hermeneutical and almost sort of life principle. Um, let me give an example of that. Um, take, for example, um, uh, Tolian Tudepin, the reformed preacher, um, famous for his Jesus plus nothing um, formula. Right? You certainly some have heard of this. Um, my students have heard of this. And his version of Christ alone, perhaps, plus faith alone, plus grace alone. Um, as he seems to be picking up on these and citing these things often. Um, just last year, sadly, uh, was disgraced uh, by multiple infidelities. At, at least I might say he, he should have been disgraced. <laughs> but instead, it, it seems like hyper-grace preachers of, of the past, he's continued to use his own sin as an example of the triumph of grace. What a beautiful disaster. Right, I am. Look, look at how needful I am of grace. Uh, what a wonderful living parable I am of the fact that I bring nothing to Christ but sin. Um, perhaps the most shocking conclusion being drawn, perhaps Tully is even more qualified to preach the gospel now. Okay. From the early days of the Reformation, Christians have heard preaching emerged, which turned grace into an excuse to ignore, or even worse, to revel in continued sin. In Luther's third disputation against the antinomians, third, <laughs> antinom antinomian, right, is a phrase used against law, um, so all grace, no law. Um, Luther describes how at the dawn of the Reformation, he had strongly emphasized the free promises of the gospel, roughly in the 1520s. But by the late 1530s, the situation had changed, and he felt it pastorally necessary to expound the law. Listen to what Luther writes, quote, But now, when times are entirely different, antinomianists, as kindly theologians, hold fast our words and our doctrine, the joyous promises of Christ, and what is worse, want to preach only them. And they do not observe that men have changed, that they're becoming and actually are secure and wicked, and inconsiderate and thievish, yes, Epicurean, and they fear neither God nor man. And just these encourage and sustain them with their doctrine. Now our people want to take the sermons from time to time of oppression and now proclaim them in a time of security. This is not rightly dividing the word, but to tear asunder and scatter God's word and despoil souls. That's what Luther says. Now that suggests actually, interestingly, a few things. First, um, those hyper-grace positions are really nothing new. Second, they aren't really following Luther's own trajectory. Uh, they're, they're not exactly Lutheran, no matter what people claim today that use that sort of language. And, and third, Luther's objection about the absolute freeness of grace given in God's provenient work in us, uh, toward us, sorry, in Christ, never means we can rationalize our continued sin as a cheerful cause for the increase of grace. Um, of course that is scriptural ground, right? Um, and, and why Luther would worry about this, not only in Luther's complicated relationship with the right star of the Epistle of James, but also in Paul's exposition of the gospel in Romans, Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue sinning that grace may abound? Right? What's Paul's, Paul's famous answer? Right? Meganoita, may it never be. Um, or, in a letter mired, uh, to a church, sorry, mired in sinful Corinthian culture, Paul writes, Such were some of you, but you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our living God. You notice in that 
that passage, that the Trinitarian agency, the living God, our Father, working forth in the Lord Jesus Christ in us by the Spirit. The error I might suggest, again, perpetrated by hypergrace teaching is that it terminates the work of the Father in the person of Christ's earthly career, which I think is actually a very bad misreading of alone, and, and instead Christ claims Christ saves me and stops there, neglecting the whole Christ, the totus Christus, which includes the resurrection, the ascension, and the continuing work in his heavenly session, including together the mission of the Spirit, who definitively brings this reality to bear on the church. Again, as scripture is bearing witness to here. I'd actually submit then a large part of this sort of defective talk of Christian living, sanctification, springs from a less than fully Trinitarian account of divine agency. Um, it just kind of names something of the Father's pardoning word in Christ's accomplishment and stops there. Um, you could see that really clearly um, if you wanted to read another Reformation figure. Um, Calvin's uh, exchange with Soleto, um, he, he says almost the exact same thing it seems to be at one point when he talks about Christ being our justification. But that means we actually get Christ. And when we get Christ, we actually get the Spirit. And the Spirit is actually our um, regeneration, the word he uses to talk about both, both the, the transformation and growth in us. And he just ties together God's triune agency, saying salvation is about all these things. And so Sadaletta was wrong to worry that the preaching he's doing is going to cause people not to be faithful, but actually have every gift from Christ to continue to grow and be faithful. He's just explained it. Um, interesting parallel here, too. So that's how it can go sideways, or one way I'd say sometimes Reformation solas can be wrongly picked up and applied. And I would actually say an anecdote to this is actually understanding these are meant to express the full Trinitarian agency of God. And when you express that material principle, you actually see how these solas weave together into something much bigger. Um, let me say one of the more practical now on the other side ways that we might think about what the Reformation is saying about the absolute primacy of God's action and consider what it means for us as the church, particularly the church that hears God's word and then proclaims God's word. So first, the life of the church. The church has life and exists because of God's act of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And with the reformers, the church, we want to confess, is a creature of the divine word. In this, God's primary saving action is followed by a further divine action where God institutes the means for the public proclamation of the first work. Again, quoting 2 Corinthians 5, 19, second part. God is entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Included, then, Paul says, in divine reconciliation is this further divine reality, the proclamation of this, grounded in God's primary work that's displaying the effectiveness of that work and calling that to bear on creatures for the application subjectively of that objective accomplishment of God. Notice again, there's no compromise when Paul does that between God's divine agency in creaturely activity. In the next verse, 2 Corinthians 5.20, that creaturely, uh, that comes through creaturely activity through whom God makes his appeal. God makes his appeal for reconciliation through us. So Paul just weaves this together. And then reconciliation and its administration then through human messengers forms a single complex act. 2 Corinthians 6.1, these two working together, Paul says. Now, again, it's fascinating because Paul is using this language here, talking about the primary action of God, reconciling us in Christ, the secondary action of God where he publishes that in and through the church, us as agents in and through that, and then how Paul says these two things work together, don't displace each other, they work together. Now, bringing together divine and human agency like that, what is the preacher doing? I mean, that, that's a pretty practical, important question. How is the preacher actually part of that action? Well, this is uh, no space here for a full theology of preaching, nor am I equipped probably to offer one. But let me offer this by way of initial orientation. Again, one final John Webster quote, very helpful, I think, here. It's tempting, he says, to think of the task of preaching as one in which the preacher struggles to, quote, make real the divine message by arts of application 
and cultural interpretation, seeking uh, rhetorical ways of establishing continuity between the word and the present situation, then and now. Built into that correlational model of preaching, which by no means, Webster says, is the preserve of the liberal Christian tradition, are two assumptions. An assumption that the word is essentially inert or absent from the present until introduced by the act of human proclamation and an assumption that past, uh, so that the present is part of another economy of reconciliation in which the word was only antecedently present and active. Here's where he disagrees now with that model. The church of the apostles and the church of now form a single reality, held together not by precarious acts of human realization, right, but by the continuity of God's purpose and active presence. The preacher, therefore, faces a situation in which the word has already addressed and continues to address the church and does not need somehow by homiletical exertion to generate and present the word's meaningfulness. The preacher speaks on Christ's behalf. The question of whether Christ himself is present and effectual is one in the realm of resurrection and the exaltation of the Son that has already been settled and in which the preacher can safely leave behind. That approach to the ministry of proclamation is actually extraordinarily free. As an occasional preacher of the ministry of reconciliation in Christ church, which has its life from him because it, it hears from him and only then does it speak, affirming Christ's ongoing work in the spirit is, is liberating. Why? Well, put simply, our job as ministers of reconciliation is not to make relevant the gospel. Christ's act of incarnation in his continuing presence, thus his condensation and his accommodation to our creaturely estate, is not at rock bottom a human act. It's a divine act. And by grace, divine reconciliation is now proclaimed through different languages, through a variety of metaphors, many host cultures, but God has already condescended and is continually making real uh, himself. Gospel ministers in union with Christ by the Spirit accordingly speak of God's reconciliation already most fully present in Christ himself and presented to us uh, and by us in the Spirit in the proclamation of Holy Scripture. Again, to be clear, what am I saying here? This doesn't mean that the preacher doesn't do anything. Preaching is commissioned human speech, Scripture seems to say, by which God makes his appeal involving human agents and activity. Augustine very helpfully reminds us here in On Christian Teaching, quote, the human condition would be wretched if God appeared unwilling to minister his word to human beings through human agency. Thus God does use, like Augustine says, human agency rather than, quote, broadcast direct from heaven or through angels. Um, Augustine's finding here in this section. Um, that truth empowers us, Augustine believes, and I, I know he's right, to use philological, semantic, literary, and historical tools, but we do so in a way that recognizes the fact that scripture is ostensive. It's signifying speech, and it points itself to another matter, uh, another reality, the triune God who's present to us through it. An interpretation of that signified speech is not the final object of our exegetical labor. Seeing and exhibiting God is. Right? Um, the exegetical task is not an end. The exegetical task points toward God as the end. Um, and that kind of language in Webster and the Reformation, I think, helps us with seeing the triune agency, helps us think very differently about the act of proclamation. Becoming forgetful of that is really easy to do particularly amongst conservative evangelicals, um, of which I am one. That balance and that art of employing our creative resources in service of the ministry of reconciliation is a sacred task. Scripture warns us not many of you should become teachers. Still, Christian ministers should proceed in the cheerful confidence that in the economy of God's divine grace, 
creaturely speech, our words, are sanctified and greeted by the gift of divine speech as we proclaim scripture. And chastened and healed by God's spirit, commissioned human speech can take its proper place in service of the prophets and apostles in, as Webster calls it, the domain of the word. And that is good news about good news. And we'll stop there because I've been going long enough. So thanks for that. Um, It's a very good it's a very good question so if i'm talking about the primacy uh, of the doctrine of the trinity or really trinitarian agency probably the best way to say what i what i believe in trying to um, why do reform confessions as they develop begin to put scripture in first place um, thinking of like the westminster confession for example maybe a very famous one we can think of um, what i'm trying to surface is and, and you notice i kind of picked and chose um, Intentionally so. Um, some of the early seeds of the Reformation seem to have this instinct most clearly. It seems to me Luther is saying some of these things very directly. Calvin seems to pattern this as well. Um, my own reading on perhaps why the Reformed confessions might begin to move Scripture forward, um, in one sense, is the question of authority and how that might be clearest, most clearly articulated. And if Scripture is where we are hearing uh, the divine voice, not from um, Pope, for example, the very thing they're arguing against. Um, fronting scripture itself is one way to front the, the location of which uh, and where we are hearing the divine voice from. Um, and and I, again, I think that must be part of it. I, I don't want to kind of reach too far. I wouldn't pr want to in history and say the sort of pressures that come later with sort of orders of knowing versus orders of being um, around the modernity and the enlightenment that come after um, some of these confessions are exerting sort of backwards pressure. I wouldn't exactly say it that way, but it probably is a question, it seems to me, of how authority um, is being talked about and it becomes a sort of polemic perhaps to organize. That, that's my instinct. Now, um, th there's nervousness, maybe one other thing I could suggest that I, I believe in the reform tradition sometimes um, particularly on, on how one might draw the doctrine of the Trinity. I could use Calvin as one example of this, particularly some of the technical phrases used for the Trinity that aren't uh, directly drawn from Scripture. Um, Calvin's nervous sometimes about these terms and, and is nervous if we, uh, what, what place we should give them in theological construction. So how the doctrine itself of the Trinity stands with respect to Scripture. Um, I do think then there's sometimes following that nervousness, um, which not all the Reformed have. Um, again, the Scholastic Reformed seemed not to be nervous in that way, but there's a, a minority report, we might say, coming out of Calvin, that, that does actually, is very nervous about sort of tactical language about the Trinity, that would again seem to say, let's, let's take the language of Scripture first and primary, and then speak um, out of that following sort of the order of our reception of, of these promises of Christ in Scripture. Um, I, I think there is there's seeds there. Luther seems, again, to me different than Calvin. Um, Scott Swain, I think, has an article that, that's pointed this out, and, and others have suggested this, too. So I think there's, there's at least a couple things going on, um, but I do think you're quite right, um, and of course, confessions would bear this out to say there's a disorder, or there's a reordering, shall I say. I think it's disordered with, with Dr. Webster. Um, I think we can take that also to how we think about the Trinity. Just one other comment on that. As sort of Bible Christians, um, as, as many conservatives and evangelicals are, 
I think we have this in sync we get, and I think it's reformational in some ways from our confessions, even if we're not confessional type Christians, to say sort of show me the biblical basis of this, and I'm sort of fronting again the doctrine of scripture when I say that, which I think is a wonderful question to ask. The, the difficulty is, is there also a second important scriptural question we're supposed to ask along with that? Not what's the biblical basis of the doctrine of the Trinity, but what's the Trinitarian basis of scripture? Once we've sort of seen that God in scripture, do we then ask a question about not just the order of knowing, how I've come to know that God triumphantly in scripture, but what's the actual basis of scripture itself? Um, and again, some of the early, earlier statements uh, in Reformed thought um, do this ordering, um, which is more traditional ordering order, and it, even like in medievals, like, like Aquinas, right? God, and then all that's not God. Um, and later, uh, Reformed confessions and treatments sometimes don't. Um, Again, I, I like Bobby here. Um, he gave me the one that, that does this in a way that makes much sense to me. Even treating scripture, you know, uh, within a doctrine of creation that's created by God. He kind of puts things together in a different kind of way. But there is, there is a variety here. And, and I think if, if that variety means we can't ask that second question I asked, what's the Trinitarian basis of scripture as well as what's the biblical basis of the Trinity? We sort of only asked half the questions. We're truncated. Um, and I think that's what I probably have learned from Professor Webster's instinct there. Not sure that answers your question, but it's some, some musings on it. Um, I, I'm not a historian of doctrine. Um, historians of doctrine will probably answer your question better. Yeah. Good. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir. You had mentioned um, the, the slight difference between your use of formal and material. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you say more on that? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, what he does is actually a, a bit unique, too. Um, but taking that term formal and, and material, often the formal principle of, of the Reformation is named exactly what we were just talking about. Sola Scriptura becomes the formal principle of the Reformation. Um, and, and I instead was saying, well, actually, the formal principle is justification by grace through faith, this, this phrase um, that's drawing together a couple moments uh, in scriptural teaching that Luther seems to be drawing off of. That's the form but then materially underneath it um, is, is the actual triune agency of God. That's what's uh, causing these formal claims to be made. Um, it just, it, it's a way to try to hold together God's action, God's agency, as I was talking about, with God's work in the world um, across kind of the spectrum, rather than just picking kind of the termination of God's work in these actions and then treating those things independently. Again, that's what I'm suggesting. Some of these later um, misreadings of the Reformation I think we're actually doing just that. They're taking these kinds of terminations, uh, formal statements about what God has done in the world and don't hold it comprehensively together with the whole triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit's agency. And if you see that the reformers really do have that, um, and it's more, maybe again to the last question, um, to the ask, it, it's more implicit in some ways. I'm trying to make more explicit, aren't I? Because I'm, I'm keep naming in the same way and then quoting scriptural text, quoting Calvin on faith. <laughs> Um, quoting Luther. Um, Luther makes it somewhat explicit in his catechism um, and some other places, but um, it's not always so explicit. And so I think I'm going to have to say it's more like subterranean. Um, they're using this language, the pattern of the institutes seems to follow some of these instincts and the claims they're making seem to depend on them. Um, again, the, the way I would actually tell the history here is some of the early reformers um, Again, Calvin being one of them, second generation reformer, are a bit nervous about some of the language technically that's being used about the Trinity for fear, it seems, of speculation and extra biblical kind of uh, philosophical reason, various things like this. But they don't actually go far from those kinds of sensibilities. They use implicitly those sensibilities, as Calvin just cites from Scripture again and again, which is using these, uh, has these Trinitarian uh, patterns of God's agency in them, because this is the God of Scripture. Um, you get a generation or two further, this is my reading of history, and actually some people start without those explicit statements of the kind I was making, moving even further away um, from this, and you eventually get to things like Ritchell uh, and others, um, that actually are kind of following in a certain biblicist sense what they'll claim, a uh, Reformation tradition, but they've divorced it from kind of clear talk about God's life in himself, um, what's thought of as metaphysics um, later. And again, I, I'm suggesting now back to your question, that's a mistake. We, we want to actually have both some clear description 
of the ground of God's action in his life and himself and of the sort of shape of God's action in his agency and of the kind of termination of God's action in these declarations and stuff. Um, but yeah, but back to your original question, Sola Scriptura is usually fronted, and that's similar again to what was said before. I would want to do that, but I talked about Sola Scriptura as the triune God being communicatively present, which is not how you will see explicitly in any direct way Calvin or Luther talking about scripture, but they won't quite say it as, as nearly as, as sharp as I did. You get something like that later in some ways from Bob Ig's continuing notion of what inspiration means. He gets very Trinitarian as he describes that, um, and some other figures, he's not the only one. But um, I picked and chosen my favorites. Um, there's some sampling going on here, no doubt. Yeah, good. Other thoughts or questions? Yes, go, go ahead, yeah. Oh yeah, so, does somebody else have something up here? Yeah, up front. Oh, yeah, please. <clears throat> Yeah. And talking about preaching, and yes. And your thoughts on teaching. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned that in passing a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Paul's reference about not many Asian teachers. Yeah. Um, and teaching seems to be a, uh, a gift that's inside the church. Yeah. Um, and then I was also thinking about um, the way you were talking about how, how the word preachers preach the word that um, Augustine, in his On the Teacher, yeah. talks about. I don't know if you're familiar with that text, but he talks about um, passages. Yeah, what, if, if I had more, what's, oh yeah, sorry, we're repeating the question. Um, the question is, there is this uh, line that I was picking up at the end of this application of these principles of what does it mean to preach, what does it mean to teach, how do we think about teaching and preaching as gifts in the church, and how particularly we might reflect on Augustine's use of Christ himself as the teacher and everyone else sort of speaking forth that which Christ teaches. Um, how any of that might weave together. Um, so if I had more um, space or could cut back some parts that are extraneous here, which is what I'm going to try to do after, um, I would actually have made a bit of a case. When I say this is a retrieval uh, at the, it happening in the Reformation, I do think it's a particular retrieval of some talk of agency that happened consistently in and through the Patrician period. Um, and particularly Augustine himself. Again, I don't think it's, it's a mistake that um, Luther was an Augustinian monk and that Calvin is citing Augustine um, quite a bit when he cites Church Fathers, that some of these same instincts of speaking, once they are speaking about the triune God in the way that comes to be developed in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, um, and then the, the Son, particularly in Chalcedon, uh, and the definition there. Once this becomes solidified, and, and again, Augustine, I take it as a helpful synthesis uh, of some of this teaching, you're going to see again and again and again this very direct talk about divine agency like this, and that would be a great like another example again from Augustine. I think that's getting recovered would be my claim um, in a certain sense in the Reformation. They're picking back up on a pattern that was already there and on a pattern that the patristics were actually picking up on from Scripture, and then reasserting that over and against uh, a notion of divine agency where Rome has actually collapsed that in some way in the church, or as Webster kind of keeps insisting, made communicable that which is properly Christ's or incommunicable, or made representable that which is non. I, I take it, again, those kinds of things from Augustine then, with my first instinct, are precisely what's being recovered, and, and they're intentionally being recovered, um, in a sense. Again, I, I, I provocatively meant to say, I'm less clear reading Trent and some of the responses that that was actually fully grasped. They, they don't seem to go after exactly that point. The reassertions seem to be about particular practices being the proper practices, um, or about particular modes of ecclesial life being the right modes of ecclesial life. But the doctrine of God and, and agency in that sense isn't actually being treated. Um, perhaps, again, it goes back to the comment I made earlier, because some of these these uh, material principles I'm suggesting they're working from are sometimes sub -latarian. like they're, they're below the surface it seems and, and they're, they're built into the structure of their thought, they're sometimes being expressed, but, uh, but they're not always being forefronted and nearly in the way that I did here. So I'm making again this kind of dogmatic claim that the spirit of the Reformation, that the, the principle that's actually driving it is an account of divine agency. 
And when you grasp that, the pieces fit together really well and show you precisely what they're saying differently. I take it that wasn't unique to them, back to your question, that, that Augustine, you'll find very similar kinds of things. Um, and, and in other early figures that are talking about the doctrine of God to that length. Not sure that answers your question fully, but that's just that's some thoughts on it. Yeah. Let me come back this way. Yes. How do you see this understanding of the Reformation playing out now with regards to a broader uh, ecumenicism? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how might I see the understanding of the Reformation as an account of divine agency, um, God's primary action in that, play out in terms of ecumenicism? What ecumenical force, um, or maybe cash value, if I could put it bluntly, might it have? Um, it's a great question. Um, I mean, I want to actually go back to the Reformation first um, and say, like some of my friends who are Reformed scholars would say, it seemed even at that moment the church had an opportunity to hear that critique for the kind of critique it was and to perhaps embrace that. Um, and, and that was missed. I, I mean, I think I have, we have to be honest. I would want to be as a Protestant, committed Protestant about that, that, that there was a, a rejection in some way. Again, although I, I've, I've equivocated now and said I'm not sure how clear they knew what they were rejecting. And that maybe is the path forward now. Um, perhaps, again, if you want to talk Catholic Protestant dialogue, for example, um, and some have tried this, the kind of mode I've spoken in here, you, you'll find little hints and traces of it in Bart's, uh, Bart's piece that he wrote after uh, Vatican II when he went and visited about divine agency. Even his telling of the Reformation, it often talks about divine agency, unsurprisingly, um, in, in sorts of ways that I do here. And I might ask then, yeah, if that, was, if that was actually not rejected as that claim, can we go back and actually talk about that still again with the Catholics, perhaps? Um, Roman Catholics, that is. Because um, again, the Protestants are claiming this, that they're actually more Catholic, um, right? That they're recovering this kind of account of divine agency that is truly what the church should be saying. So perhaps, perhaps again, if that, hasn't, if that aspect of the Reformation hasn't been rejected, again, it's been at these flashpoint formal levels, Perhaps there actually is some room to dialogue there. Um, I've actually found some, some purchase on those things I felt like in friends that are Roman Catholic that I discuss things with, because we can say things like, we have the same doctrine of the Trinity, which is, which is a great step one. We have the same doctrine of Christ, which is a great step two, um, if we're looking at least at, at creeds and councils. Um, and then we can say, step three, how do we talk about that action or agency in the world, which is where we're gonna differ um, I do think it's actually the right place to talk about those differences and to take seriously those differences and to see if there's reconciliation. With like, if I could go one other way, reformed like Lutheran dialogue. Um, again, I think I, I gestured at the end, there are some things that are sometimes called Lutheran or Lutheran-esque um, kind of approaches to reformed questions that are thought to diverge from reformed um, Protestant approaches. That I think if one comes back to see what Luther and Calvin and these figures said on agency, you can see actually much more fruitfully how close they might have been and how that actually might cash out in traditions that have drifted away from each other somewhat um, and find some common ground to talk perhaps on even amongst those traditions. Christoph Schwobel in his um, Creature of the Word makes this point continually. He's a Lutheran and he keeps citing Calvin and saying it, it's where they're so close here we should pay attention to and this would actually be a point for sort of closeness with these groups. So I think there's some room for inter-Protestant dialogue, and if this is truly the sort of thing that's driving these flashpoints, it's a point we can go back perhaps and talk to Rome about in some ways, or our Roman Catholic friends about in some ways um, as well. I think, there, I think there's some power to that. Again, I'm the kind of dogmatician, though, that wants to be really serious about the difference of material claims and actually thinks the path forward is taking those differences seriously and then asking questions why as I would as a Protestant, which one of those claims produces the most compelling reading of scripture? Um, which one actually holds that together and actually names the reality by which we've drawn, been drawn into in the church? And, and kind of goes at those seriously rather than says, well, we're using different language, but we're saying something similar. I really want to take seriously where we're not. And agency is, is where I would want to point. So I think it, it's helpful in that way because it problematizes difference and maybe offers a path forward. 